Hi everybody, welcome to lecture five. Actually, lecture five A, the first part of lecture five. And before we dive into lecture five, I just wanna refresh our memory about uh, this uh, nomenclature God compound that if you named it in our study groups in class, congratulations, that's awesome. You can handle anything. But if you want more practice at complex problems like this and how to name them, then I probably mentioned it in class, but in case I didn't, I'd like to emphasize the fact that this structure over there, uh, right over there, up there, has been drawn with a program called ChemDraw. ChemDraw is a beautiful free software program that you can download onto your computers using your wellesley.edu email because Wellesley has bought the license for ChemDraw. Thank you. Um, it's got all sorts of very cool bells and whistles that we will use in our course and you will definitely use if you take Chem212. So one of the cute bells and whistles that it has is that as you can see, it draws this structure for me and it's very pretty. But one of the things you can do with it is once it draws this structure, you can ask ChemDraw to name it for you using the rules of IUPAC. So that's where this name came from um, and it's very complicated and long, but if you wanna practice nomenclature, I highly recommend you use ChemDraw. You can draw out specific molecules, try to name them, and then see what ChemDraw says the name is. You can also type in your own name of compounds that you see on a piece of paper and then ask ChemDraw to show you the structure of the compound for the name you've given it. A wonderful tool just to practice nomenclature because the textbook will never give you problems as complicated as this, but I might because we all have beautiful rules to follow now for IUPAC, okay? All right, let's dive in. Ooh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, this is the perfect tune for today's class because we are going to be talking about how light is used, specifically infrared light, how to light up organic compounds and how lighting up organic compounds with infrared light helps us identify them and helps us see one organic compound and how it's different from another which you're gonna find very useful in lab and also in the lecture, okay? I can't help it. A little movement, a little energy, enjoy. All right, let's dive into this part of how to see orgo molecules. And it starts out with infrared spectroscopy. So infrared light is going to help us look at polar covalent molecules and polar covalent bonds specifically, like this compound over here um, in this corner, lots of different functional groups. Do you know your functional groups yet? Can you spy all the different functional groups there? Have you seen the ones on the back wall here? Do you have your, where is it? My post-it notes full of them. Have you got your post-it notes up and around? The sooner you actually can get your post-it notes up with your functional groups and get them into your head, the easier even IR spectroscopy will be. Because this is a polar covalent organic molecule and infrared loves to absorb certain regions of this molecule in the IR spectrum, loves it. But as soon as you actually just deprotonate that carboxylic acid, remember that's an acid, and as, as soon as it becomes ionic, even though the rest of the molecule is full of polar covalent bonds, all it takes is one little ionic bond to blow it up and no longer allow IR to see it. IR has no interest in this ionic molecule. It will only look at the polar covalent one, not at the ionic one. So keep that in mind. But luckily in orgo land, we all we play with are these organic molecules up here that are very neutrally charged. So why does infrared radiation and light specifically have an interest in polar covalent bonds? Very briefly, and I do mean briefly, 
this in no way is going to fully dive into the reason why IR light, um, our organic compounds absorb IR, but a little bit. And I'll start with our most famous little molecule of water, H2O, that these are polar covalent bonds too. And there is a dipole moment that goes right through the middle of this molecule, the average of the two individual bond dipole moments. Now, if this molecule happens to be moving around and I wanted to change the dipole moment by either you know, bending these bonds up would cause a different size dipole moment or bending them down and putting them real close to each other, that would be a different dipole moment. If it goes through this bend, this is requiring, as you can see, some energy on my part. Oops, no, no breaking of bonds yet. Some energy on my part to bend these bonds. The energy needed to bend bonds matches perfectly with the energy in infrared light. So the bending of bonds, the stretching of bonds, as we'll see in a second, all requires a very perfect amount of energy for each type of bond. And each type of bond requires a very specific infrared light. So we can use IR radiation to play around with and look at all the different types of bonds that are in our organic molecules. So did I say different enough? Different covalent bonds will absorb different IR wavelengths and show up in different regions of the IR spectrum. So this is a great tool for us because we will be able to tell different compounds apart from one another as if the IR and the IR spectrum for each compound were acting like a fingerprint, an actual fingerprint for each molecule. So as you can see, our, some of our favorite drugs are in here. Um, they all have slightly different functional groups in them and slightly different covalent bonds in them. And notice how their IRs are all slightly different. And I could tell morphine apart from dopamine and apart from caffeine. And one thing I want you to just start paying attention to is there's certain regions of the IR that are gonna be very important to us. Right now, it just looks like a mess of peaks. And I mean, peaks of absorption are the ones going down. But if you notice, there are certain peaks like, oops, like this one here, that I don't see anywhere in my dopamine or morphine. And that's because that region of the IR is very specific for a very specific type of covalent bond known as a C double bond O. So a C double bond O absorbs IR light in this region when it stretches. And notice morphine and dopamine don't have any C double bond O's. So this is why there's no absorption in that region. Very cool. Let's go play. The more IRs we see, the easier this will get, I promise. So as I mentioned, I talked about bends already, but really covalent bonds can stretch too and change a dipole moment if I was water and my two H's. I could stretch them out and that would change the dipole moment, or I could bring them in real tight, and that would change the dipole moment of my water's OH bond. So stretching and bending, these are ways to change dipole moments, and different amounts of energy will be required to do each of those. For example, this little region right here, just below 3,000, 2,900 to 3,000 range, those little peaks right in there, are due to the fact that there are sp3ch bonds that love to stretch and this is the symmetric stretch of ch bonds off of this methyl group on methyl benzene otherwise known in old school terminology as toluene so when toluene is put in the ir spectrum i mean iro uh, spectrophotometer it produces this ir spectrum where we would predict the sp3 ch's to absorb around 29 to 2800 so that's what's going on there if you like this little movie please feel free to download it for free you can go look at it on your own it's a really cool program called ir tutor and the ir tutor program is from columbia university just head over to that website over there and you can actually download it for free and then 
it'll give you toluene and you can go click on all of the peaks in here and it'll show you what kind of stretches, what kind of bends are responsible for all these peaks. Okay, it's very cool. Now, this is a very inundating, I know and I totally get it, this data table is overwhelming. There's tons of information in this data table. This is called our literature IR absorptions data table. A copy of it, as you can see, is in the appendix of our Chem211 online lab manual because we will be using IR spectroscopy a lot in IR to I mean in lab to identify compounds. And we will be using it on any practice problems I give you where I give you a bunch of IRs and ask you which compound, caffeine, morphine, dopamine, which one best fits this IR. So really each one becomes a fingerprint for a specific compound. I will always supply you with this data table on any exam. You do not need to put this on your one page of notes. It is something I don't want you to have to memorize, but I do want you to be able to use this table, use it well. For example, you can already see the peaks that we were talking about for um, the SP3CH stretch is already being discussed here in this one section for alkanes, that it's between 3,000 and 2,800. So you can know that almost every organic molecule you play with is gonna have some kind of CH sp3 carbon hydrogen bond in it. It's a very popular one. Other ones that might not show up or do show up are, for example, the C double bond O stretch that we were talking about earlier. The problem with this C double bond O stretch is it appears in lots of different functional groups, like this aldehyde, this carboxylic acid, uh, where else? Yeah, the amide. So this C double bond O stretch appears in lots of different functional groups. How do you know based on IR which one you have? This is very, very important. If you have a certain functional group, notice for aldehydes, I have to have all three of these absorptions. Because of this unique hydrogen coming off the C double bond O, this will produce these two absorptions at 2700-ish and 2800-ish. So if you really have an aldehyde, you will see all three of these absorptions. If you only see the one for the C double bond O and none of the other two, then maybe you have the ketones. Or maybe I go and start looking at the carboxylic acid or the amide and notice those have other peaks that have to go with them as well. So please make sure that if you say you have a specific functional group, that you actually have all the absorptions for that functional group. One other thing I'd like to highlight here is notice none of these absorptions for these ranges go below 1400. That when we look at our IR spectroscopy and when we look at an IR spectrum, we are going to avoid this busy, busy region. Do not look there. That's really nice. That means that mess is never going to be analyzed. And the reason is all those peaks there are different kinds of stretches and bonds for the same functional group that show up above 1400. So it's kind of redundancy built into the IR. Also, it's a mess. So unless you're an IR expert, we never go look in that region, okay? But feel free to look at IR Tutor and look at that program and click on one of those peaks down there. You'll see some pretty wild stretches and bends that are redundant for functional groups above 1400. So this molecule is, this IR is for cyclohexanone. And you can see this molecule has nothing but CH2s, which are sp3 hydrogen here that we talked about. You'll see a few below 3000. And then here's that big, bad, beautiful C double bond O stretch. And that's why this is the only thing that it will show up. Keep in mind, like any lab data and any spectroscopy, there's always going to be little itty bitty peaks that are kind of weird. Try not to go crazy with them. 
And in the whole scope of things, as you'll see from Lecture 5B and Lecture 6, we are really trying to use this piece of data along with several other pieces of lab data to help us identify cyclohexanone. So this won't be the end-all be-all. You don't have to pull everything out of an IR. And that means it's very, very important to realize the IR's main focus is functional groups. So functional groups are what you're going to use and pick out of IR. Oops, sorry. You will never be able to put a structure together for an unknown compound solely based on the IR. Sorry, but more data is coming. More data is coming that'll help us piece these things together. So for class, please try to look at these weird and cool drugs and see which one of these will not show an higher absorption around 1700-ish and come to class and talk about it with your study group members and see if you can figure that out. Okay, cool. Practice, practice, practice. The more IRs you see, the better you're going to get. So which of the following IR bands here in the uh, multiple choice would you not expect to find in ibuprofen? Kind of cool. Now you can identify ibuprofen uh, separate from, say, morphine or caffeine and therefore use IR to make sure you're taking the right drug. Very important. So that's a possibility. Try to come to class with an answer for this one and check on it with your study group members. And then that will be very cool. 5B is going to look at this, these instruments. Do you know the name of these instruments? Do they have anything in common? Well, if you're curious, check out Lecture 5B. And this will give us another piece of data about unknown compounds to help us identify what's in our Orgo land universe and be able to identify the structure of compounds and drugs. Okay, I want to do a quick shout out to Sandfly Barbecue in Savannah, Georgia. Oh, they got such good, good, good barbecue. Now, I'm sure you have your favorite restaurants too. And in our little Orgoland tour group, I know we're traveling through Orgoland. Who knows what restaurants are in there? <laughs> so please feel free to post on Sakai or send me emails of your favorite restaurants where you love to eat and where the best food is that you found. I'm always looking for a good place to eat. All right, let's keep our tour group going. And I hope to see you in class. And also I'll see you again, lecture 5B. All right, have a great day. See you later. Bye.